What's up, you guys? Welcome to episode 404 of the Established Run NBA podcast. I'm Mike Gallagher doing a three-man pod with Drew Nick Meyer and Sam Jeffrey. Now, we are going to talk NBA win totals, going to have some bets for you guys today. Pretty excited. Always one of my favorite pods to do. A lot of takes. We'll have some disagreements, have some agreements. Should be fun. Dink, how you doing? Good. I enjoy talking through the win totals. Uh, I've already made some bets myself. Some of the lines are still there. Uh, sometimes when I make bets kind of early on release, they they move. These have not. So there will actually be some lines that I can give out as well. And um, as always, just super interested to kind of talk through the, the strategy of over-under betting, the thoughts on how to kind of approach it. I think every season changes, whether it's regards to you know different league rules. We had COVID years the last few years that we had to deal with in terms of uh, trying to figure out things and I, I think it's it's a fun exercise to talk through and you know who else who else could could uh could not love locking up their money for six months for a potential you know eight percent roi gotta do it every time uh uh-huh. and so how are you doing over there i'm great uh obviously i've been on the pod a few times with just you but this is my first time being on with the both of you so excited about that and uh really fun pod i think to uh to be joined the two of you so looking forward to it yeah, we're, we're recording this uh, in early September. Obviously, there's been some line movement. A couple teams, for instance, like the Thunder have got a lot of money behind them. They moved up a couple games. Pacers have moved up a couple games. A couple teams have moved kind of a game and change based on the juice, but those two ones were, were kind of the most that moved since the opener, just to note that. Uh, I did get OKC in the opener. I'm not going to talk about them today. I think it's a little iffy where they're at now. But yeah, Dink, you said you wanted to talk about just kind of how to go through this uh, and Overall, so I hand it to you there. What what are you kind of thinking through when you're looking at win totals? Yeah, the first thing that I try to think through is kind of changes. Obviously, you want to talk talk through like changes on individual roster and teams, and, and we'll talk about that. Um, but in terms of a macro environment, the things that I try to think think through are the magnitude and impacts of tanking on a given year mm-hmm. and how valuable the draft class is to potentially tank for. This one is a very valuable draft class to tank for uh, with Cooper Flag, Ace Bailey, a couple other key uh, key high-end prospects as well. So there's going to be players that people are going after in a big way, and that impacts win totals, right? You might see lower-end uh, win totals as teams kind of race to the bottom uh, towards the end of the season. It might inflate some of the middle-tier teams that might get more softer wins towards the end of the, the season. I like looking at the schedule. We talked about this before in terms of number of back-to-backs, um, rest advantage, rest disadvantage games. Those were all things that we talked through when we did the schedule release pod. I like thinking through roster depth and what types of assets teams have to be able to improve their situation or in situations where they don't have a lot of uh, assets, how vulnerable are they to potentially like losing an injury? I like to think of age uh, of the team, how healthy they were last year, and are they likely to replicate that health kind of this year going forward? These are all things that I like to think through when evaluating a season long win total prop and so these are these are fun conversations to have in terms of i just want to kind of line up a couple different boxes in my favor uh along with where i think a team finished last year relative to projection and then kind of lean in and hope that directionally i stack up a couple of those favors i've got a team that's got improved depth or a team that's Mm -hmm. i'm expecting regression from health or a team that i'm expecting regression in close games or a team that i'm expecting to have assets to be able to contend or a team that's in a conference that's a little bit weaker this year just start stacking up little edges and kind of lean into them and that's how i like to approach win total betting yeah a little bit of continuity for me i've got actually one team that's kind of light on continuity that i've got it over on uh, and then one that has a lot of different continuity that I've got an under on that we'll get to. Um, so, yeah, uh, Sam, anything you want to obviously think they did out really well, but anything you wanted to note that uh, you think the people could have an edge on just overall? Nothing really to add. I think Drew uh, really broke it down well. And then, um, yeah, in particular, the death point for me uh, mm-hmm. is something I really like to think through and kind of the fragility of teams where, you know, you kind of want to balance the high end talent with what's behind them, the injury hits. So, just really thinking about the range of outcomes on a team, too, is. Uh, what I like to think about for sure and just like if their top one or two guys goes down how safe are they behind is pretty much the question we're asking ourselves on all these so yeah let's start it off here uh maybe we could talk through some other honorable mentions along the way but hey we'll stick with the format and, and go our top three favorite win total over under some I will hand it to you first for your third favorite and we did have a couple agreements some one of some's favorites is one of mine as well but hey you know I'll I'll make way for I, I got a lot so uh, I've had plenty to spare here but uh, so I'm go ahead on your third favorite win total over under. 
Sure, yeah. To kick us off, I'm going to go with the Houston Rockets over 43 and a half wins. And just as we were talking um, about depth just now and kind of what we're thinking through, um, the high end talent of this team is, you know, there's a lot of teams in that like 40 to 50 win range in the West. And the top end talent for Houston, it's, I don't believe, up there with the rest of them. But this team has a ton of depth and not only a ton of depth, but a ton of depth at almost every position, um, you know. And not only with that depth, they got a ton of guys who are young and could definitely take a step forward. I mean, you got Amon Thompson, Cam Whitmore, Tar Eason, Jabari Smith. I mean, Shen Goon at the top. So mm -hmm. I just I feel really good about this team, you know, from an 82 game standpoint. And I don't think there's, you know, even one piece or two where if they go down, everything's in trouble. Of course, you know, Shen Goon and Van Vliet, I think, are the two pillars of this team. And I really want them. But. I really think this team is set up well to get through the season and they got a ton of young guys that I could see taking a step forward and just adding to that. So really in on this Houston team and uh, with Ime uh, coaching, I got a lot of confidence in him. We saw what he did last year um, coming in and making them, you know, already 40, win 40 wins off the top. So really like this Houston team and them over 43 and a half wins is uh, my first choice. Yeah, uh, I'll let Dinko first. Do you how how do you feel? I'm I will say I'm probably not even close on this one. I would not want to take this one, but and I'll go into why, or I could just do it now if you want, Dink. But um, how do you feel about this bet? Yeah, go ahead, Mike, and uh, and then I'll yeah. So through. there's a, there's a couple things working against them here. Uh, the number one reason for me I'm not on this one is their strength of schedule is really hard. Uh, they have the third hardest strength of schedule going forward, and I don't like my number two thing is. I don't know. I'm just rubbed the wrong way on this Jalen Green extension thing um, with the way it's coming out. So I think that the depth could get cut out from under them. I don't really trust him necessarily. Those are really the two biggest things for me. Just that schedule is really hard. They have a lot of really good teams in their division. So that's pretty much the top t top two for me. Um, and then also Dylan Brooks. I don't know. Dylan Brooks rubbing the wrong way. Missed a lot of shots. Choked a lot of games. Was kind of struggled a little bit late. But yeah, clearly their, their roster is good. I just hate their schedule. Is really the the number one. Just you, like I'm sure Dink's gonna say the same thing, but like I've got to feel really good about a West. And I actually I have I have one, uh, but um, yeah I don't know. It's, I, I'm just a little bit nervous. I'm betting West overs on Team Melissa. If you're really good about it, yeah I I love Houston long term. I love mm -hmm. the roster that they're building. I think they've really dug themselves out of a hole pretty quickly with some of their draft picks. They like the Reed Shepard draft pick this year. Um, and Thompson, what he showed last year was really encouraging. Cam Whitmore as well. I think their depth is is a real, real big plus. The challenge for me is ultimately like every team in the Western Conference, when you look at their team win totals, generally is lower than the win total that they had last year. And the reason for that is because in the Western Conference, we're expecting Memphis, who has a win total that is like 20 wins higher than what they had last year to be much, much more competitive. And so Houston is one of the very few teams that the win total is actually higher than they won last year. And so the market is betting on a lot of growth for a young team, which look, I understand betting on growth for a young team. I think that's a reasonable bet to be making. And I think there are older teams that you could be concerned about um, the legs kind of falling out from under them, but it's not, it wouldn't be on my card. It would be a pass. It's not like I'm playing the under, right. it would just be a pass for me um, at this point. And I like what the rockets are heading directionally. Um, and I can see the reasons for optimism and enthusiasm behind them. And I don't think there's any risk of them tanking or like pulling things out from under them. They have plenty of assets to be able to acquire things like they could, and they've shown a willingness to try to win now, right? Like hiring Ime Adoka, signing Fred Van Vliet last year, Dylan Brooks. They were trying to win games late last season, even when it was kind of against their benefit. Uh, they made a push towards that play in late in the season. So yeah. I don't think you have to have any concerns about their intentions, but I do have concerns about just kind of where they stack up in, in terms of a very, very deep Western conference. Yeah, two positives to hand it back to Sam to close it out. Um, they had a couple of really sticky stats defensively. Their transition defense went to elite levels last year after being horrendous, and then they were getting killed on all the open stuff. And they really corrected that, and it was pretty sticky, not just on you know giving up open, you know getting lucky on, on there. So um, and then as, as you kind of mentioned there, they had that they just rattled off that what ten straight when, when Shingun got hurt, um, and then. You know, they they made the Warriors sweat. You know, but um, yeah. So any any I thoughts? Should, to, I should I should I should note. 
should note, I was saying that their win total, that they their total is higher than their wins from last year. But I should note that their Pythagorean record last year was actually 44 wins. So it's basically in line with what their Pythagorean record was, which just takes their point differential and converts it to a win-loss record. So they were theoretically unlucky in close games last year, and they only ended up winning 41 games, but their Pythagorean record had them winning 44. So this, this win total is basically having them kind of holding serve against an improving Western Conference. Yeah. Sam, any thoughts on our yeah. thoughts on, on the closing out? Yeah, you guys bring up a lot of good points there. And I understand, too, that's kind of my one hesitation of this is any over mm-hmm. in the West, you got to feel really strong. But it's just this collection of young guys. I just I have a ton of confidence in eBay to get the most out of them. And just the step up they showed last year, at, like you said, with the Jalen Green extension, Shen Goon hasn't gotten his. There is a little bit here, but I'm just kind of betting on this collection of talent as a whole. And if, you know, even a few of these guys take a step up, I'm – I'm really excited about what they could do in the West, but you guys do bring up, you know, certainly um, yeah. valid points too. Yeah, they're super insulated. Like I feel like if you fall, sh- like it's just one of those. If you lose it, it's gonna be like ah, you know, you're losing like the last week of April kind of a thing. I don't think it's. Mm-hmm. I think it's gonna be pretty close, but I think you're not gonna get it early either. Though, uh, okay, Dink, um, what's your third favorite win total over under? <laughs> this is gonna be surprising because I've loved their off season. But this is this is what you get when you get the robot in the room. Um, is you can love the off season and you can still think a number is too high. And so I'm going to go back to the well on the Milwaukee Bucks, who last year that was one of our favorite unders last year um, in terms of team. I believe they're at like 54 and a half, 55 and a half last year, and we were on the under last year. Uh, they end up in total um, winning 40 nine games last year, but their Pythagorean record was only a 47 win pace. And you look at the the roster, the upgrades in terms of Gary Trent Jr. over Malik Beasley, I think that's an upgrade. Um, getting, uh, um, my gosh, I'm blanking on uh, his first name, DeLon Wright. I was DeLon thinking Wright, Darrell. Yeah. I just kept saying Darrell in my head over and over again. Uh, <laughs> DeLon Wright. Um, I think is a big backcourt uh, addition as well. And and long listeners of the pod know how much I like DeLon Wright. But this roster was pretty healthy last season, with the exception of Chris Middleton. Chris Middleton played 55 games last season. Giannis played 73. Dane played 73. Brooke Lopez played 79. Malik Beasley played 77. Most of their guys were healthy last season. They played pretty big minutes as well. And we're talking about this is going to be the age 34 season for Dame, age 36 season for Brooke Lopez, age 30 season for Giannis Antetokounmpo after playing in the Olympics as well and playing summer uh, all, all season long. So I, I, I really worry that this team that doesn't have draft capital to really go out and kind of make additions, they are one big injury away from like being really bad. And the Eastern Conference is a spot that I generally want to be taking overs. Um, We'll talk through some other overs that I like in this conference. But this number feels a little bit high for me right now. So Milwaukee currently trading at 52 and a half, um, excuse me, uh, 51, uh, 51 and a half on Caesars, 50 and a half on uh, FanDuel and DraftKings. I'm good with the 50 and a half, but I think the 51 and a half are really good um, where, where you can get those. And just generally, I think this team is going to end up kind of in the upper 40s once again. So I don't think this is one you're going to win by a lot unless Giannis gets hurt for an extended period of time. But I don't think it's one you're going to lose by a lot. I think the paths to this one losing by a lot are much uh, narrower than the paths to, to winning this one by a lot. So, and And I would also note that just like, not even if Giannis got hurt, but Brooke Lopez has been a super impactful player for them for a while. And he's been really durable the last years. And now he's 36 and behind him is Bobby Portis. Who's a, who's a really solid player, but not a player who does a lot to contribute to winning against starting players. And then behind him, there's nothing. So the, the, the roster is very vulnerable and they don't have a lot of ways to add to this roster, which is one of the, one of the, you know, little edges that I like to stack up. So uh, Mike, what are your thoughts on Milwaukee under 50 and a half this year? I'm a pass. Um, I don't know what's up with Middleton. I think that's the biggest. That's part. That's part of the things you mentioned. That's probably the thing I'm most excited about. If I'm betting the under, double surgeries. You know, different ankles, different times. Uh, he's aging. He's missing time all the time. You mentioned Brooke being older. He's in a contract here. If it goes bad, maybe they try to flip him. If things go really bad, you could kind of hit that early. If if Giannis does get hurt there, so because um, it, it like without thinking, like my first thought was I was like oh, okay. Like Milwaukee could hit it, and then I thought through it a little bit more. I was like, okay, yeah, I don't want to take this over for sure. And then I, I would probably lean a little under just because you have so much room to kind of, as you mentioned, like have it fall off. They do have a pretty soft schedule um, that yep. also hurts it too. So I'm a pass, but um, I'm 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 more into this one. I hate to be the negative, as you know, you guys are awesome, 
I'm being like there's, a little bit negative here, but um, you'll get me back. You'll get me back. Yeah, yeah, I would say their schedule is softer, but everybody in the Eastern yeah. Conference is softer if yep. you're a good team yep. in the Eastern Conference. Um, but they do have a net negative on rest disadvantage. They have 13 mm -hmm. rest disadvantage 13. games compared to 11 rest advantage games this year. Um, and I think rest disadvantage is kind of a big deal for an older yeah. team. So 13 is among the higher uh, numbers of rest disadvantage games. It's the most in the league, that along with the Clippers. So that is another factor uh, leaning into my decision on the under for, for Milwaukee. Sure. Sam, how do you feel about this one, Sam? I'm in full agreement with Drew here. Um, kind of like he said, I'm a, I'm a little worried about unders on these high-end East teams in mm -hmm. general just because, you know, the bottom is just so horrific. But this team, when I think of, like, just fragile teams at the top, this team really sticks out. Um, so, like, you, you guys were saying, the, the game counts last year. And the other thing is, too, like, Giannis, who, you know, in the past with Bud, he he'd stayed pretty healthy and everything, but he was never really playing 32 33 minutes a game. And, um, you know, when Doc came in kind of middle of the season, they were really, really pushing Giannis, and he just couldn't hold up. So this is another team where, you know, I, I think the high-end talent here is, is really strong, but I also think it's incredibly fragile. And if anything happens, I don't really trust the depth pieces behind them. And like you were saying with Middleton already, um, mm -hmm. you know, dealing with those um, surgery, I believe, on both ankles. So, yep. yeah, in general, like, you know, these – these um, these high-end East teams, a little worried to go under, but I, I, I am agree with Drew here. I do like this under. Yeah, I thought about taking Boston under for similar reasons, uh, and <laughs> and Chris has being hurt, but um, not not gonna do it. I think Boston's really really good. So my third favorite team to bet on for win total over unders is you know kind of in the fold of not bending Western Conference win total overs. But I'm doing it for my third favorite. Um, it's a team I think's insulated, and it's a team that has no continuity. They got a lot of change. It's the Golden State Warriors. I like them over 43 and a half wins. The whole question here is if Steph plays. If Steph plays 60 games, I think this absolutely coasts. If it doesn't, I'm a little nervous. But I think if they're insulated a little bit more than we're accustomed to, I think that, A, Draymond could still handle. We've seen Melton run a little bit of point. Buddy Heald could have a little bit of on ball. You know, We've seen Kyle Anderson, whenever they're missing ball handling, Con miss a game or whatever, he can handle. Pods can grow as an offensive creator. I think they're really insulated there. Um, you know, I like what they – you know, they still have Moses Moody. They've got, like, a lot of pretty good caliber depth. Yes, you know, Melton could get hurt too, but Buddy Heald's been one of the most durable players in the NBA. I like how this roster's balanced out. You've got a little insurance on Draymond uh, and the former Kevon Looney, who looks great in the uh, in the offseason here. Um, yeah, I just like how this team's put together. I, you know, they when they're on this, uh, this if, 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 like I said, if Seth gets 60 games, this is coasting. Like, I think they could get to like 52, 53. Uh, I really like their offseason. Uh, it's just the continuity and the Steph factor. Uh, have me a little bit weird and Draymond being older too. And Draymond, you know, don't go punching people. Um, that that could get me undone a little bit too. But I think how do you feel about this Warriors over? Tepid on it. Um if I had if I had to pick a side, I'd be on the over side, but but concerned. I mean it's it's a veteran team that you're talking about Steph being in his age 36 season, Draymond in his age 34 season. Uh, those are the two players that kind of move the needle most for them. Mm -hmm. I do think if you just look at it holistically from did this is this team better from where they ended last year? Mm -hmm. I think the answer is yes. I think you know you're you're substituting Clay Thompson for Buddy Heald, DeAnthony Melton, Kyle Anderson. That's a lot of added depth uh, on a team that didn't have a lot of depth before. And really, the only piece that they lost was was Clay um, from a from a you know rotation standpoint. Then you've got expected growth from guys like Pajemski. Um, Trace Jackson Davis, Jonathan Kaminga, young players who played well last year, and you would expect them to continue growth. And then you've got Moses Moody, another depth piece that could could shine as well. And they won 46 games last year with a Pythagorean record of 47. So you're just asking them to hold serve with what they did last year. Obviously, it's a more challenging uh, Western Conference, and the concern is that well, Steph played 74 games last year, mm -hmm. so you're not. It's it's hard to imagine getting a healthier Steph season, but you only got 55 ish games from Dre last year, I think it was. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think from a health regression standpoint, I'd expect them to probably be neutral. You know, maybe Steph loses some more games, maybe Dre plays some more games. The guys that they add in should be more healthier than the guys that they took out in terms of Chris Paul, Clay Thompson. Clay did play 77 games last year, but you would just think 34, mm -hmm. like you're replacing younger players. So um tepid, but if I had to make a lean, I'd be leaning towards the over here. Yeah, last thing I'll say was I mean Wiggins was a shell of himself for the last two seasons. Yep. Maybe he kind of gets back to the 22 version of himself. So, Sam, what do you think of the Warriors here? Yeah, I don't feel strongly 
either way here. Um, I just have a couple concerns on so like for Curry, um, where we have the games played concern. Obviously, last year um, he was really up there, but also for him for minutes, where even down the stretch last year, where they really needed wins to make a push for the playoff, Kerr was not really pushing him at all. So I don't really expect his minutes to you know be too high. And then like you were saying with Wiggins last year, he's had back-to-back seasons now where he hasn't been great, and even you know he's missed games with these personal issues. Draymond every year we have. His suspension risk. So, as a collection of like the team, I, I kind of like a lot of their guys, but I just have a, I have enough questions where I'm a little hesitant in this West to mm. take the over on them. And then, yeah, the Curry one is the big question, like you were saying with the games played, yeah. though, where you don't you got to think you're not really getting the same uh, season you were from a health standpoint. So, don't feel strongly one way or another here on the Warriors. Yep. Cool. So, what do you, what's your second favorite over under here? Yeah, my second favorite under, or well, it's going to be an under this time. It's it's going to be the Washington Wizards under 21 and a half wins. Um, it was really between them and the Nets for me uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> for the under, but I, I think of them very similarly. And, you know, Washington's two or three wins ahead, so I'm just going under on them. Um, look, this team won 15 games last season. They weren't good at all. Um, they trade Denny away. Uh, they bring in Brogdon. They bring in Joe Val. They draft Carrington and Sar, obviously. So a lot of young talent, but this team just has – a ton of incentive to lose. They're not very good. Their pick this year is top 10 protected, uh, which they'll have no worries. They'll be getting that. I mean, even if they did want to compete, I can't imagine they do so. But, like, you know, there is just really, really lack of talent here. And I think, if anything, it's probably going to get worse if they do. You know, they're already probably going to try to trade Joe Val. Kuzma could mm-hmm. go away. So, you know, this year I think is really just about getting those young guys out there, getting a minutes, and I think it's going to be some pretty ugly games for them. So, I feel pretty strongly about this one. And um, yeah, give me give me the Wizards under twenty one and a half wins for my yeah. second favorite. It could be a total. huge t- tank off uh, between them and the Nets. Uh, yeah, I'll let you first think thoughts on on this Wizards <laughs> under. My biggest concern on the Wizards side of things um, is. That while they only won 15 games last year, they had a Pythagorean record of 20 wins last year. So they were just really, really bad in, in close game situations. And they still do have like some NBA level talent with Kuzma, Brogdon, if he's healthy, we'll see Joe Val, um, you know, Jordan Poole. We'll see if Jordan Poole can do anything to contribute to winning at all. I think the the plus side that you really want if you're on the side of the under is you want Sar playing a lot because I think it's going to take yep. a while for him to be a positive, impactful player at the NBA level. And I'm a little bit concerned just with their signings that they've insulated themselves from having to play Sar a lot uh, immediately. That's kind of the one thing that I'm like, uh, are they going to play Sar a lot immediately? And so mm-hmm. this is one where I I think I'd be more likely to bet on a number two or three weeks into the season on them mm-hmm. than I would at the start of the season, simply because I'm just a little bit concerned that they might r- rattle off a few wins early in the season just by like not playing SAR, by playing the vets, by trying to showcase Brogdon. And then they go the Utah route where they like heavy tank late or Portland route mm-hmm. that we've seen the last few years where they run off a bunch of losses late. So for me, it's less about, I I'm fine being on the, on the side of leaning into Washington late season collapse I just think I can maybe get a better number earlier in the season um, because I'm a little bit concerned that Brogdon playing early in the season for them in a showcase could rattle off a few more wins than then. And every win matters when you're at these really low levels. Yeah. Well, I looked at their schedule right now. Uh, Boston, Cleveland, Atlanta, Atlanta, Miami, Golden State, Memphis, Orlando, Houston, San Antonio, Atlanta. And then they get some easier stuff. But that first month, month, yeah, pretty tough. That's that. that in, in, and that's, you, you got to hope that they, I mean that's that's the hope that they start off really poor. Yeah. Those those Atlanta games could be winnable yeah. games. They're one home, one road. Um, but yeah, but that that is that does work in Psalm's favor in terms of yeah. it being a tough schedule to start because I do think the risk is more on the early side of the season than the late side of the season. I think by the late side of the season, you might mm-hmm. not see Kuzma here. You might not see Bro- yeah. you probably won't see Brogdon here. Uh, Joe Val, you, you're probably going to see him here, but you might not see him playing as much. Um, it's early in the season though, that those three guys are like playing. And if they're playing like meaningful rotation minutes, uh, a little bit, a little bit nervy, but that, that early season schedule certainly helps. Yeah. They do have 13 rest advantage games, only two teams and more than nets and the Warriors, which I mentioned. Um, but yeah, I'm with you. I think that Joe Val is going to go away for sure. I mean, I'm with you, uh, Dink on SAR being like a bad impact on winning, you know, him and Jordan Poole could be the, 
you know the 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 Vorp negative Vorp brothers, the under <laughs> value under replacement. Yeah, replacement. But um, yeah, brothers. pretty much with you there. The Brick Brothers. Yeah. Uh, how do you go <laughs> in summer league? But uh, yeah, I I thought about this one. Um, I'm like I'm waiting. Like I'd rather just wait for something to go down and just beat the books to it. I had the same thought for the Nets. But no, this is a pretty good one. Of all the ones that aren't mine that we talked about, I think this is my favorite. Uh, anything to just wrap on them, Sam? No, it just, I think, yeah, Drew, just the late season Lancers team could be like, I mean, really horrific. So, you know, like you said, the other schedule, but I feel pretty good. Like, you know, even if they're trying at the beginning and Brian Keith had a little more success down the stretch there. But in general, I feel, I feel pretty good that this team uh, will be putting up a ton of wins. Uh, for sure. And think, what do you, what's your second favorite? Uh, so this one I, I've kind of hinted at during the course of these offseason podcasts, but um, you know, if I'm betting on the Knicks at longer odds to lead the NBA in wins this year, I'm betting over 53 and a half as well. Um, Tom Thibodeau teams generally go over <laughs> their win totals. Uh, they compete really hard in the regular season. The one concern with Tom Thibodeau teams is is depth uh, because he will run them through a ringer. Mm-hmm. This team has incredible depth now uh, outside of the center position, which I think is okay with Mitchell Robinson and Precious Achua now. We'll see if they make more moves. They've got a trade chip in Julius Randle that they could pot- potentially use to improve things. And if you look at from like a, a durability health perspective of this team last year, you know, we we finally got Julius Randle missing games in a way that he hadn't really missed games before. They only got 46 games from him. They only got 23 games from OG Ananobi. In those 23 games, they were just dominant uh, defensively in, in those games. They only got uh, 31 games from Mitchell Robinson last year. I know they got a lot of production from Isaiah Hartenstein, and that is out the window. They're adding in Mikhail Bridges. Is Mikhail Bridges enough to overcome uh, the Isaiah Hartenstein loss? I think he is. Um, and then you look at in terms of uh, how they performed last year from a Pythagorean standpoint, you know, they were a 53 win team last year. They only won 50 games, but their Pythagorean record was 53. I think the the upper tier right below them is vulnerable in the Eastern Conference, Milwaukee and Philadelphia. Obviously, I recommended the Milwaukee under. If those two teams are vulnerable, I think one of the teams that benefits most is the Knicks. I think they can just rack up wins on everybody in the regular season. I think they're going to compete for the most wins in the regular season. They also had kind of a fluky schedule uh, quirk last year where they played Milwaukee like five or six times because of the in-season tournament. So they ha- they ended up having like an unusually more difficult schedule um, than they were supposed to have. So that's a small thing. They do have more rest disadvantage games than rest advantage games this year. So it's not a particularly um, great situation from a rest perspective. But I really think there's also going to be some hidden value in bringing out the real Mikhail Bridges that we didn't see last season by playing with his college teammates. And I think this team, when you talk about whoever they're starting, we're talking about potential bench pieces of Josh Hart, Dante DiVincenzo, like really, really, really deep uh, on, on the bench here. They also, um, you know, we've got a, a lot of production out of Deuce McBride, who, who really played well last year brought in um, campaign as well to add depth there. So they're like covered pretty much everywhere, but the center spot and the center spot, you can also hit in the buyout market during the course of the season, if you run into issues there. So I'm, I know it's a big number on the Knicks side of things, but I honestly think that from a regular season perspective, their number should be relatively close to the Boston Celtics. And right now it's five away from the Boston Celtics. I think it should be like two or three away from the Boston Celtics personally. So I'm on Knicks over 53 and a half. Pretty, pretty, uh, pretty hot, uh, pretty hot takes there. But uh, being that close to Boston is is, is something. But uh, Sam, Sam, what do you think of this one? Full in agreement with Drew here. Um, okay. Like, like he said, um, the the center position makes me a little worried with Mitch in Precious. But also, I think you know it's fine. It's nothing amazing, but it's enough. And Tibbs, you know, his system in general is not relying a ton on the center, so I think they're fine. And then you know the rest of the you know just from one through four. I mean, the top end talent's really good and. You know, I think the depth behind them is really good where DiVincenzo and Hart were playing, you know, 40 plus minutes in the playoffs and, you know, even Deuce at times too. And now these guys are like, you know, when they're fully healthy, they're probably like 20, 25 minute per game guys at the most. So um, just really deep, really good high end talent. And you also got Tibbs working for you where he's going to coach every game as if, you know, he needs that win. And it's game seven in the final. So a lot to like here. And in general, you know, these upper echelon East teams, I'm just, I like to be bullish on them. So a lot to like here with the Knicks. And it's certainly a big number, but I'm fully in agreement here. I like this over. Yeah, it got bet up a little bit. It opened at 51 and a half. So the market moving them up a little bit. And one thing I'll add, I'm, that's just too big of a number for me to bet. 
Um, so I'm, I, I think it's a good bet. I don't think it's a bad one. Um, because that's why I don't have it. Uh, at one point, I'll add, like, don't for, I say this all the time when we did the content. OG Ananobi guards and beads sometimes, man. Like, they could play, they could be more willing to play Randall as a quote unquote five because they have OG Ananobi to guard fives. We know they don't like Randall guarding fives. So I think you're a little bit insulated that way. Yes, OG has his injury issues, but I think having Deuce behind Brunson and having all those wings, they're shown to be very durable. Um, does give you a really high floor. That's just such a big number. Like I, it's another one where like you're not missing this bad. You're not gonna like miss this by four or five. You're either gonna like just miss it or I don't know. I just think it's a little bit of a tighter range than you do is all. Oh, I think they're I think uh, they're okay. I think they're winning like fifty eight plus this year. I think I think they're clearing yeah. this <laughs> easily. I really like I, yeah. I honestly I, I mm-hmm. this team was a fifty three win team from a Pythagorean record last year in an East mm-hmm. that I think is largely getting worse with the exception of maybe Philadelphia because they they'll they're getting Paul George. They'll be healthier with Joel Embiid. Boston got worse, right? Like they're going to lose Chris Ops for a couple months. Um, who else in the, in the East is getting better. And so for me, this is the, this is like, they just got to be as good as they were last year. And they added bridges for Hartenstein. I'll take that trade off. So for me, I, I think they're going to cruise past this number. I know it's a big number, but I just, I yeah. I think they're one of the best regular season teams in the NBA. I don't think they'll I don't they think just, it'll translate the same way in the playoffs. Yeah. But I think I I think they're one of the best regular season teams in the league. My biggest negative would be that like run they had OG back and they was, could not be stopped. Like that was like yeah. inflated them way too much. So that's my that's my thought. I don't know if they were like that good, but yeah, OG when they had OG they crushed. So to that point, like maybe they are that good. So I don't know. It's just uncomfortable for me, but I get it 100. percent Do you have anything you want to add, Sam? No, uh, just yeah. I, I, I maybe I'm more on the Drew side here of the optimism, where I think yep. they'll probably be closer to sixty than fifty. I just feel like, I mean, the rotation is going to be so strong, and from regular season standpoint, I mean, it's hard to really find any weaknesses with them, except like I said, the five yeah. position makes you a little worried. But I think they got enough there, and everything else so strong that you know, I, I really like the over there. Yeah, really, just historically, it's hard for me to get that that big of a number. But yeah, all that yeah. stuff makes sense, and like I said, they're pretty, they're really, really insulated. Um, there. So uh, my second favorite one is Clippers under 40 and a half. We've talked about all this. We've talked about this pretty much since it came out that we've got major concerns on this depth. We know Kawhi. We saw that total garbage injury reporting they had when they called him questionable. Still couldn't make the Team USA. He's had this degenerative knee thing since. Um, well, this is actually a different knee. He's got two bad knees now. Like we, we used to say, oh, this is the bad knee. When it was the good or not the bad knee. Now he has two bad knees. He's got all this mileage he came off of so much mileage last year stayed really healthy i think that really undercuts him there uh we've seen james harden's drive rate go way down age starting to catch up to him can he stay healthy can the wheels fall off there's so many ways this team could just have the wheels fall off in a significant way without really any creation besides those two guys unless it's kevin porter jr who's like a total tank machine uh with the way he plays so they do not have we talked about being insulated from your where your star players going down this team has perhaps the worst case of it among the teams who you know maybe can get a top four seed here so really just betting on that norm powell's had some injury histories in, as uh in his career as well um you know mo bamba their backup centers her all the time they need zoo to play like 80 83 games somehow uh for them to be healthy enough um uh, chris dunn i'm not buying he's had some injury history Derek jones jr i think that was mostly fluky last year with that breakout season with luca um batum's old there's a bunch of olds yes tyloo's great but um this is this actually might be my favorite um, just because their schedule's hard. They have, I think, the most uh, rest disadvantage games. And that's, you know, an old team having rest 13 rest disadvantage games. That sounds really bad. So uh, I'm pretty into this one. I was into this one since the day it came out. I'm surprised it hasn't moved too much. I um, think, how do you feel with this one? Yeah, this would have been on my list ahead of Milwaukee um, in terms of a top three. I like this bet more than the Milwaukee one. Um, you mentioned that they don't have a lot of room. They also don't have a lot of assets to be able to add to the team. And mm-hmm. the offseason acquisitions that they made to try to replace Paul George, right, were like Derek Jones Jr., Chris Dunn, try to get better on the defensive side of the ball and kind of make up for that. Well, what happens if James Harden, who hasn't had as many health issues but has had a harder time kind of carrying the load offensively from an efficient standpoint, or Kawhi Leonard, who has had all those health issues, what happens if one of them goes down for a meaningful amount of time? Mm-hmm. Now, from an offensive role standpoint, in terms of guys who can kind of create their own shot on the team, you're relying on Norm Powell or you're relying on Kevin Porter Jr., which we don't know what his situation mm-hmm. is, or Bones Highland. It's players that have 
historically, I, Bones Highland and Kevin Porter Jr., they don't defend, so they've been really net negative players on the court just generally. Mm-hmm. And then at the center position behind Zubats, you lose Mason Plumley, a player who really like added a lot of value there. You had Mo Bamba, who, again, health issues. Uh, so this team is very vulnerable and has a lot of like role, ma- role pieces that I like, but the role pieces don't work if they have to get elevated to primary pieces. And this team is one injury away from that happening. You add in the fact that the Western Conference is all getting stronger. Obviously, this team won 51 games last year, but they had a Pythagorean record of just 49 wins. Paul George alone is probably four to five wins. The West getting... Uh, better on the whole is probably another two wins, uh, two to three wins in terms of, and then you just factor in like they had a healthy season from Kawhi last year. They got 68 games from Kawhi last year. We haven't seen that many games from Kawhi, you know, very, very regularly. Before that, it had been 50, 52, 57, 60, and nine the previous years. So if that number, if those numbers get back into the 50s, all of a sudden things look really, really tough for LA. So I like the only, the only positive that I would have the only like hesitation I'd have at all, which I would comfortably bet this would simply be they have no reason to, they have no reason to, to throw in the towel. They will be trying the whole season long, like new arena. Like there's so many reasons for them to be trying to, to keep the fans engaged and they don't have control over their picks. So like, it doesn't matter. So like, you're not going to get any tanking value. You're bet- you're betting on injury and age related decline, not necessarily the team like throwing in the towel. And we know that this team is willing to mortgage future assets to try to keep things afloat. So like you don't like that's the risk. Now, they didn't mortgage future assets to keep things afloat by extending Paul George. So maybe that is changing their tune and they're like, "Hey, if things are slipping away, we're just going to let it slip away." But that's the only negative I can see on this. Um I'm, I'd be comfortable betting under 40 and a half. Yep. How are you feeling about some? Yeah, I'm in full agreement with both of you. And this would have been on my list oh. too. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about these teams that are like fragile. I mean, I don't think it gets more fragile than this because mm-hmm. Kawhi already, like Drew said, the 68 games last season, it's hard to imagine he even gets there. And these games when he doesn't play, you know, where is the offense coming from? Because yeah, they obviously lose Paul George and Westbrook. And, you know, that's a ton of usage going out. And then what they brought in, like I was saying, Derek Jones Jr., Chris Dunn, Batum, these are not scores or guys are going to go to and then does that force them to have to play kevin porter jr and bones highland more which you know if those guys are the guys that are carrying usage for you you're not in a great position at all so you know you combine all of that they have the most back-to-backs in the league um there's just really not a ton to like here um like you guys are saying though the one i guess maybe concern is there is no incentive for them like to lose at all so they're gonna be going for it at all injuries or no matter what but i just don't think this team is good enough for even if going for it at all in this really tough West that we keep, you know, emphasizing on, there's just a ton of ways. I think this goes bad. And again, even if everything does smooth sailing and they get good health, I'm not even positive. That's enough to get over here in this West. So yeah, definitely uh, one of my, one of my favorite bets here and in, in with both of you guys. Yeah. Second type of strict, the schedule and handing it back to you, Sam, was this smooth sailing a pun on the Clippers reference uh, <laughs> a and B what's your top, uh, top uh, bet here? <laughs> uh, well, nope, I'll keep the funds away, but just with that, my top bet here um, is the New Orleans Pelicans under 46 and a half wins. Um, I've, I've been on this since the beginning um, with this team. So as a collection of pieces, um, I don't hate it. And like that DeJounte trade in a vacuum, I think was fine, but mm-hmm. it's just a weird fit between all of these guys. Um, you know, already with BI and Zion, they're two guys who we... I think are, you know, they're really high usage guys. They want the ball in their hands a lot. DeJounte is kind of in that same old too, where he needs the ball a lot. And so you bring in that and then kind of, the, we kind of were on this with the Knicks with just the center um, concerns, but I think it's far worse on the Pelicans team right now. We have Daniel Tice right now projecting to start at center. And um, I'm not even sure on most teams, he's even in the center rotation so much for starting. And then what's behind him Obviously, it's nothing uh, to be excited for. And then the one counter one says, well, if you, you know, you just play Zion off the five, and then that brings in more minutes for Trey and uh, her, presumably they're off the bench. But it's also like, you know, you're relying a lot on Zion on that case. I don't know if you want to put all those five minutes on him. And yes, mm-hmm. he did play over 70 games last season. But before that, he wasn't exactly, you know, the guy we were looking at as a model of health or anything. So it's just I, a collection of pieces, one through four. I think it's fine, but I don't, I don't really 
like the fit here. And I think the center position is just such a problem. And Drew was saying earlier, we're in the bio market. You can kind of make things work. But when you're starting this poorly already from the start, uh, it's just such an uphill battle. So there's just a ton of concern here. And that's not even bringing up the BI trade stuff mm-hmm. right now, which I guess that's the you know counter to is, oh, they can just turn him into a big and then you know everything's great. But what team is really wanting to give up you yeah. know, stuff for BI right now? New Orleans would theoretically want to get better. They don't want to give BI for worse stuff. But I mean, what team is doing that right now and then want to pay him? So just a lot of questions, weird fit. And I just think in the West, the margin of error is so low that, you know, there's just a lot of concern here. So my favorite bet right now is a uh, spell against team under 46 and a half. Yeah, the Brandon Ingram stuff on the low post podcast, like apparently his value is really low, not going to mm-hmm. the voluntary team mini camp. He had that uh, Instagram post about knowing his value, feeling really bad. Um, yeah, it, it could be really rough. So I agree with everything yeah. you said. Dink, what do you think about this one? I think it's interesting that in both the case of Brandon Ingram and Zach Levine, I think these players who historically have put up good scoring performances, but the league is now valuing them differently than they might value themselves. I'm interested to see how that like just changes the perception of players, their perceptions, players perception of themselves going forward uh, in, in when, when scoring might not be as emphasized as like the main way to, to value yourself. Um, But this is a, this is a roster that I've long loved in, in new Orleans. Mm -hmm. They lost a lot of pieces of depth pieces that I've really liked over the years. Dyson Daniels, Najee Marshall, Larry Nance Jr. Um, I mentioned the center and how you can kind of get through that on the buyout market. Well, they're already in the buyout market. I mean, Daniel Tice has been a buyout type player. We're talking about needing something from Carlo Makovich. Um, they maybe trade Jemison. Like that's a that's a you know that's a, not a buyout type player, but a off the street type player, ten day contract type player. That's a lot to kind of rely on here. And so you you now have taken this team that I loved all their depth in the past. And depth is a, a strong source of me wanting to bet into overs. Now you make them more vulnerable and the top, you know, five or six are intriguing in terms of DeJounte Murray, CJ McCollum, Brandon Ingram, Zion Williamson, Herb Jones, Trey Murphy. That top six is awesome and like really exciting and really intriguing. After that, in terms of guys that I feel pretty good about, it's Jose Alvarado and not not nothing else really and so there's a there's a big question mark in terms of like what can this team get out of they had a jamal Kane. i don't mind that we'll see if jordan hawkins can take a step forward in his second year but there's not a lot of room for jordan hawkins to play with the way that they kind of set this roster up so i think they're a roster that's pretty mismatched right now we'll note that they did win um fifth uh 49 games last year have a 52 win pythagorean record so they were actually quite uh unlucky from a from a record standpoint but the looming factor here is Zion Williamson played 70 games last year. Zion Williamson mm-hmm. played 70 games last year. They won 49 games. The year before, uh, they won 40, uh, I think it was 42 games. Zion Williamson played uh, 29 games. The year before that, they won like 36 games. Zion Williamson did not play. They, they, they're they very vulnerable to Zion Williamson's health. And I think it's a big question mark of whether last year was him turning a corner in terms of being able to manage his conditioning and his fitness and his health, or it was an un- anomaly in terms of his health. And I think that's the big question mark for me because so much is riding on his shoulders and putting more physicality on him as a five is not something that I'd want to do with that asset that I'd be so careful about trying to maintain. So I like this one as well in terms of under 46 and a half, but I do think it's going to be a sweat. Um, unless Zion's like, in, unless Zion is only playing like 40, 50 games, I think this will be a sweat just because I think DeJounte, CJ, Ingram, Herb, Murphy, Zion is is a is a really solid top six. Yeah, I'll add two things. One, you know, Brandon Ingram had like only maybe two small injuries that we thought were small. And he still only played like 64 games. We were like, when's he coming back? When's he coming back? He does it all the time. So I think there's a good chance that he misses games, assuming he actually is playing, which is a whole other thing we, which we got into. Talked about a couple of pods ago. Had more depth if you want that. And they're just at, kind of random. We always compare the running back situ- situation and center from contracts, even from fantasy. The Pelicans went like full zero RB to like <laughs> round 15. Like they didn't pick up any any centers um, at all. So we'll see what they do. They, they got to be busy in the trade market here. But um, yeah, I'm with you. I love this one. Classic, you know, bet on lack of depth and things can go south and, um, with you there. Uh, Dink, what's your favorite over under? I think everyone who knows the, has listed the last couple of months knows what it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually surprised this one hasn't moved, but Orlando Magic over 47 yeah. and a half. That's what it opened at. The Orlando Magic last year, they won 47 games. 
Um, their Pythagorean theorem record was just 46 wins. So it wasn't like they got incredibly lucky. Um, and then you just look at this team and man, when we talk about depth and we talk about betting on ascension of young players, uh, Paolo Bancaro took a nice step forward last year. He's going to be in his age 22 season. Like love, love that. Uh, Franz Wagner, who was really good until kind of the, the medal rounds in the Olympics. Um, he's going to be in his age 24 season. Uh, and then you add the depth of adding in Contavious Caldwell Pope, like who everywhere he has gone, the teams have gotten better. He changed kind of the culture in, in, in the team in Denver. He did that with the Lakers before he brings kind of championship pedigree, uh, to the table. His minutes are going to come at the expense of players that really did not fit the way that this roster was built in terms of whether it's like Markel Fultz, um, who's, uh, no, no longer with the team whether it's um, Cole Anthony, it's like players that don't have kind of the, the ability to spread the floor and shoot. So they can get the ball in the hands of Franz Wagner and Paulo Bancaro and run out their lineups now with KCP and Gary Harris as their backcourt if they want, uh, and or Jalen you know, Jalen Suggs, Gary Harris, um, and and uh, can Davis call two of those three at all times, have two lockdown kind of guard defenders, uh, still have the ball handling chops from Franz and Paolo with secondary ball handling from Jalen Suggs, and then they have all the depth. Now, will Jonathan Isaac be able to stay healthy? That's the big question mark you look at from last year. I think that's the biggest thing you can point to is he was a very impactful player in terms of win losses for them last year. Although he did not play heavy minutes, he started to get ramped up kind of in the second half of the season. In total last year, he only played 58 games. That's a lot for him, but it's not like he played like 60, 70 games. So if there's regression in his health, I think that's kind of the biggest risk here. Obviously, Paolo and Franz and, and Jalen Suggs all played a lot last year. But those guys are generally like really young, really healthy guys. So I'm really excited about Paolo. And I think I said uh, age 22 season uh, on Paolo and age 24 on Franz. It's age 23 on Franz season for him, um, by the way. So like two young players. I love their ascending talent. This team just has to hold serve with what they did last year. And I think the whole conference got a lot worse. I wouldn't be surprised if at the end of the year you see this team is third in the East in in the seeding uh, perspective. They they look to me to be a team that can rack up regular season wins. And if Paolo takes a big step forward, like, oh boy, then we're really talking. But I think the downside here is very, very limited in the Eastern Conference with how deep this roster is. Yeah, I'll just say two things. I think that may even be more important than some of your points. They were second in defense last year. Defense freaking travels, man. And they're so deep yeah. there. We saw that with the Wolves last year. They have a big step forward on defense, and they were really good. Um, we're yeah. adding KCP, who does not miss games. Like, you're adding one of the best locked-up defenders who's still sort of in his prime, who doesn't miss games at all, and you're insulating the parts of your roster where you're a little iffy. Jalen Suggs, Gary Harris, you've got, like, nobody missed, nobody guards the ball more and doesn't miss games as much as KCP does. I don't have, I don't have that on that, but that's how I feel. So uh, I'm with you, just leading the defense on top of the Powell Ascension, the Franz Ascension, who, by the way, those guys don't miss games so far. Um, so, yeah, I think this is an absolute slam dunk. Uh, totally love it there. Uh, what do you think, Sam? Yeah, in full agreement with the both of you. Just starting at the top end, like, you know, Paolo and Franz, who already, you know, they've, they've, they've stayed really durable. They've really carried. And, you know, the offense hasn't been great for this team, but it hasn't needed to be. I mean, we saw what they did last mm -hmm. year. And it, they add KCP, just more on-ball defense. That travels well. Like, there's so much to like about this team. And they're just covered with depth just everywhere. And I mean, even at center with Wendell, he's had, you know, last season in particular, he had some trouble staying healthy. Well, they just gave new contracts to Mo Wagner and Goga. Mm -hmm. So they're just covered every single position with just lots of depth. Um, I think from a regular season perspective, this is exactly the kind of team you want to bet on. Um, they're just set up so well to get through the season. And yeah, I, uh, I'm with you on the boat with both of you on these. I really liked it over here. Yeah. The other I'm notes that I'll have this whole thing on here. Good. The other notes that I'll have is they're plus three on rest advantage versus rest disadvantage games. They only have eight rest disadvantage games all year long. They have 11 rest advantage games. So they're towards the higher end of the rest advantage and they're kind of middle of the pack bottom end on the rest disadvantage side. And then in terms of like growth, we talked about the growth that they have on the top end of the roster with Paolo and Franz still in their early 20s. They got nothing from guys like Jet Howard, very little from Anthony Black last season. Would it be a surprise if those guys who were lottery picks ended up elevating themselves to be much more valuable than say someone like Gary Harris in providing some of that uh, shooting punch in, in the case of uh, Jet Howard or providing some of that extra on ball defense and uh, ball handling of Anthony Black wouldn't shock me. I don't think you need it, but I think it's like 
ju ch cherry on top is like you've got this extra added out of like hey these two young guys that are lottery picks that basically didn't play mm -hmm. last year they could continue to improve as well and, and crack this rotation so i just think they're so deep so many ways for this to go right for the orlando magic yeah tied for second easiest schedule as well too so just uh this is my favorite bet that we're talking about today including what i'm about to say uh i'm on chicago bulls under 28 and a half i am being a full-on quote boy you know shout out to the emoji <laughs> we have in our slack but um I'm I I just heard that and I talked about it with with Dink on the last pod. The fact that they're even that it even is uttered out of the most respected beat that they're consent they might not even like have Levine out of the gate. I'll talk about the depth in a second. Or like Vooch can go away. They do have a, a top lottery protected pick, top ten. I think that really helps. I think this team is just like I wrote in in one of my notes. They're just a day late and a dollar short on this tank. And I think they're going to go into it here. So um, yes, their schedule is going to be tough. And also. Really, DeMar DeRozan is such a winning player and a floor raiser. Played the most minutes in the NBA. I think taking him out and adding in Josh Giddey, who I don't think is... He's like, maybe maybe this is all BS. Maybe I'm being too recency biased of him looking so poor in the playoffs. But I don't think Giddy helps their wins. He may help them a little bit here and there. But this team that was so good in the fourth, I think that's going to go away. I think they're going to have a lot of really bad losses where things go south. I don't know if Billy Donovan's going to make it to Christmas. Uh, I just think things are going to go really south for this team. I think I may actually like my Clippers bet a little bit more, and I like the Magic one a little bit more. But I'm just betting on this team going totally south for a top ten protected pick, who just has to do it. I think they finally had the pressure there, um, and I think I think they're going to be missing some depth. I don't have too much. I, I like Kobe, but you know we talked about Jalen Smith as a bit of a joke, but they're not too too deep, really. And like we just talked about, like Jalen Terry is not very good. Um, you know, barely you know barely played. Julian Phillips barely played. Javon Carter got put on the outs really quick. They they're really missing a lot of depth. Like we might be like playing like Taylor Horn Tucker DFS like uh, it's sooner or later. So uh, Dan, how do you feel about the hashtag uh, formerly your Bulls? It wouldn't be a win totals podcast if we weren't talking about the Chicago Bulls in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> Last year we eked out a Bulls over. Uh, we, we 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 veered off the path of Bulls unders for years. We eked out a Bulls over last year. So. I think the vibes, vibes based drafters, you know, we talk about like best ball season, the vibes based drafters, the vibes based uh, win total betters are definitely going to be on the underside of things here. Yep. There's a lot to dislike about what's going on with the Bulls situation. My concern is more just this, this team's history of ownership and approach. Mm -hmm. And like, we we're talking about Billy Donovan. Like I, I think he's been sort of on the hot seat for a few years, but he's got a contract that still runs uh, for another like two years after this, I think. Chicago Bulls management just does not eat contracts just generally. Mm -hmm. So like, and Billy Donovan's a good coach. So like I could see Billy Donovan, like just kind of grinding their way through to win like 29, 32 games, something like that. That's my one concern on this. Um, Bazelis also looked decent um, kind of in, in summer league, which was encouraging, but yeah, this team, they don't have a lot of depth. I think Levine and Vooch are the two pieces that they've relied upon you know, from like kind of a floor raising perspective. And they're both very disgruntled right now. And so there's a good chance that one or both of them, and I, I heard a, or saw on Twitter, someone floating around the idea of the Lakers being a potential destination for Vooch, which is very interesting um, in mm -hmm. terms of a team that could potentially fit. Um, if they get rid of both of those guys, there's just not enough talent to win a lot of games on this team. I think they keep Billy Donovan though in that in that case, and I think he'd win more than you think they should, just because I think Billy Donovan's a pretty decent coach. Um, but there's not a lot of depth on this roster uh, to insulate you. They they have a lot of incentive to tank for their pick, as you allude to. It's top ten protected. Mm -hmm. They don't have they have no reason to go and acquire more assets during the course of the season. They have done this in the past, so it's terrifying that they might even when they yep. have no reason. Um, but I think the biggest knock against this is simply that this is an organization that is not committed to losing mm -hmm. in a way that would make us feel more comfortable about this bet. Otherwise, I think it's you know all the all the vibes are in in the favor of the under. Yeah, and I'll just say one more thing before I end the song. Their start of their schedule is not good. Uh, at New Orleans, at Milwaukee, OKC, at Memphis, Orlando, at Brooklyn, can get that one. Utah at home, get that one. At Dallas, at Minnesota. Like, that's pretty tough. So two and seven. Quick. Yeah, two and seven at best. Uh, what do you think, Sam? <laughs> yeah, I'm a little hesitant on this one. Um, just because everything you laid out, Mike, was made t total sense. And I think that is the mm -hmm. rational, obviously correct move. But this, you know, this organization has at no point shown us 
being willing mm-hmm. to make the rational correct move. And that's just my one hesitation. And I think, you know, there's enough teams at the bottom of the East where maybe they're hanging around, you know, 11, 12 seed. And then they do the bulls thing where they just, you know, they, they fight to the end to get into that 10th seed. So this is one where it's just, I don't, I don't really like this team as a whole anyways, but I just think the bottom of the East is so bad and I don't trust them to really, while all the incentives are there for them to be bad, I don't mm-hmm. think like a lot of these other teams, they're going to go for it like that. So just because of that worry that they may be, you know, just from what they've shown in the past, trying more than a lot of these other bottom end teams, that that would be my one hesitation here. But I certainly, I wouldn't be taking the over anything. It's just, there's, yeah. you know, they show us enough where it makes me a little hesitant to, um, you know, to bet on that, not necessarily tank, but just bet on them, you know, for once getting worse so that's just my one worry here but like i said i wouldn't be betting the over anything either for sure uh dink any other honorable mentions or anything else you want to mention here i don't have much in the way of honorable mentions i was just looking at um miami as a team that we've been talking Mm -hmm. about unders the last few years and i actually i actually think their number is so low that I could see a case for go for for just like kind of blindly betting and being like spo over 44 and a half. Oh. I'll just take but but that's the only one that I looked at as like a potential honorable mention because they're gonna compete night in and night out. Um obviously they're vulnerable to to Jimmy Butler health, but they've had to deal with that yep. the last few years. Um Jimmy's gonna be in what what are we at? Age 35 season now. He played 60 games last year. They only got 40 games from Hero last year, they only got 30 games from Rogier. Um, 44 and a half. I like, I'm not going to bet it, but that's the one that I was like looking at that. I was like, I, that number just looks light for what they've been, uh, for the last decade. And they just always seem to get the most out of guys, even though the roster always outperforms so bad, though. the expectations. <laughs> I know it's bad, but they are always yeah. outperforms expectations. And I liked what we saw from yeah. Lil Blair, um, in summer league. Yeah. Yeah. They're just not as insulated from Jimmy. I don't think like Haywood Highsmith can't really do anything. I'm not sure. Hemi Hawk is, is kind of has this ability to kind of carry that into after the kind of breakout rookie season. Yeah. I, I thought the same thought. I was like, I want to bet this, but I, I can't bet the under cause it's Spo. but I'm um, kind of with you there. A couple of honorable mentions for me before I hit it to Psalm. Um, I almost hit the Blazers under, they had the hardest schedule, but like 22 and a half is, I don't know, man, like, I want to hit it, but I didn't. I didn't do it. Uh, and then Cavs forty eight and a half over. I think Kenny Atkins is a really good coach. I think they're put together really well. Let's see Isaac Okoro get locked in there. But um, yeah, those are kind of my my close calls for me. Anything for you, Sam? Yeah, I was looking at Denver under fifty one and a half. I have a ton of concerns about mm-hmm. this team um, from a depth perspective, but also at the end of the day, I think if Jokic is you know is playing 70, 75 games, like that's probably enough just to get you to fifty wins as it is. Even if you know they're relying on a ton of guys um that i'm i think is pretty questionable but again it's just i i don't not sure i want to bet against Jokic um at this stage and the other one too is okc now at 56 and a half is i think too high really to take it over at this point i know they opened earlier or lower but i just think this team like even in this loaded west is still like almost in a tier of their own they are so good they are so loaded they are so deep like there's just nothing bad to say about this team i love them so much but 56 and a half is just i think it's getting to a point now where um, you know, it, I'm just a little worried about the West as a whole to take a win total that high, but I, I mean, yeah. this team is so good. They're so good. Uh, and then yeah, anything else you want to mention, yeah. Dink, to, uh, to get us kind of out of here? I know we, we got some promotion to do. I was just going to say on the Denver side, uh, we, okay. we tried to hit that drum last year on the win totals podcast mm, yeah. did not, did not go well. Mike Malone yeah. undefeated <laughs> in his tenure as a Denver Nuggets head coach to the over. He's not. He's not gone under their their win total in a single season, which testament to either Mike Malone or Jokic, who one one of the two. But um, you know, in, in kind of an incredible record there. Um, all right, yeah. On the promotion front, just to let everybody know we have launched our best ball package uh, today, as we're recording this as well. DraftKings launched their uh, NBA best ball contest. We're going to work on getting rankings and content up for that. Um, reading through their rules that a contest structure and their paths to adjust our rankings accordingly because our rankings do take into account the payout structures of the contest and the playoff schedules of the contest. We've got all our stuff up for underdog going. We're streaming um, for subscribers. We're streaming um, live drafts at least once a week. We're giving a subscriber discord Q and A's that are going on as well. And then we will be launching the draft kit uh, shortly. For those of you looking at seasonal drafts, we're targeting sometime next week as the release date for the draft kit. That'll come with Mike Gallagher's top 150. 
It will come with uh, fantasy trade candidates. It will eventually come with um, ways to exploit the default rankings when we get default rankings from sites and all those different things. But um, Mike's been hard at work writing a bunch of content, getting ready for the draft kit launch. We will prob- we will most likely be launching that at some point next week as well. So lots of the NBA products starting to hit the market. If you want to join us uh, on the premium side along for the ride this season, we'd love to have you. And as always, appreciate you guys listening in. Yeah, it almost got two K words down on just the Nets trade fallout. So uh, we're uh, we're gearing up here. Pretty excited for it. Uh, very excited for this time of year. So appreciate you guys listening. We'll catch you guys next time.